and welcome to Sips of Inspiration. This is Ann Butera, and today I have Laura Ashton with me for a chat. And Laura and I, we collaborated on another video. Actually, Laura asked me to collaborate with her, and it was sort of a kick in the pants for me to make some more videos uh, and share them on YouTube. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, Laura. And I guess we'll just get started. Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So I basically do botanical and wildlife or um, illustration, mostly birds and animals, um, as well as plants. Uh, I do teach online. And I did do a lot of local teaching for a while as well. So I, I do really like teaching. Um, right now, I've basically been focusing on doing some personal challenges, um, which I think are really fun. And I've found people really like to follow along or join in on them um, on social media. So I've done a few 20 day challenges and 14 day challenges lately and um, have had like people on my newsletter or on social media follow in and join in on the prompts. So that's been really fun. And I'm currently working on a 50 watercolor flowers project. So 50 popular watercolor flowers you might find in like an English garden. And I've just been ticking away at doing the illustrations and sharing it with everyone. I don't actually have a time limit on this one. And it's sort of like a personal goal and challenge that I want to sometime put them all together into some kind of book. So. Yeah, that's what I've been working wonderful. on right now. That's so wonderful. Uh, and you said that you do local teaching. You are located in Vancouver Island, is that correct? Yeah, I'm Vancouver Island, Canada. Um, so really right above Washington. Um, we're really close to the US border on Vancouver Island. It's like actually the tip of Vancouver Island where I was born dips down below the Canadian border. So it's really kind of similar to like Oregon, that type of climate and culture so the west coast and stuff so it's a beautiful place to live yeah lovely so first you've talked a little bit about it but why don't you go in a little more detail about where you find your inspiration and if there's ever times when you are feeling stuck or uninspired what it is that you do to get the inspiration flowing again well, my original inspiration obviously is gardening and gardens. My mom is a, a big gardener and like Anne, who I know you have a lovely garden as well, no matter where I've been, how small, if it's a tiny balcony or whatever space I have, I always make a garden. Um, so just the, the plants basically is how I originally got inspired. And then I was introduced to Edith Holden's work with the country diary of an Edwardian lady. And that was when I was like, Oh, I want to be able to paint these as well. And that kind of started my botanical illustration journey. And now when I need inspiration, um, I kind of make a list every year of what's blooming. I have a little journal. So I know in advance, you know, these are going to come out in September. Maybe I'll plan to paint that because sometimes you don't have all the time in the world and you have to pick one out of the many beautiful things in bloom, especially this time of year, like May, June, July, when there's so much out. So I always feel a little bit torn of like what to paint and like before it fades away. Um, and when I'm feeling stuck, so I just being out in the garden or going for a nature walk or anything like that, I've recently started bird watching as well. So that's really inspired my bird paintings. Um, but when I'm feeling stuck, uh, that's kind of how I started this 50 watercolor flowers challenge is um, I, I feel like I get distracted really easily. And then it's like, I'm gonna paint this and I'm gonna start this, and then I'm gonna do this. And then I ended up doing nothing because I'm starting and you know not using my time efficiently because the type of painting like yours as well, and it's more detailed. So, you know, sometimes they take longer. So um, that's when I started these little challenges. I started with a 14 day challenge and it was just summer themed botanical items and then I did a, a fall flowers for 20 days and that's how I realized that really worked for me and kept me inspired and and focused as well so I felt like I got more finished which kept me feeling more inspired and then I'd post it and share it with my audience or 
you know, even just friends and family, and then they'd get excited and kind of know what they were following along with. And so it really helped keep me going. And um, so I've just kept doing that. And so I have the 50 flowers series I'm working on as well. And then I'm also working on just like a series of hummingbirds. I want to improve my bird painting. So I've decided just to focus on all different species of hummingbirds right now. So I've been kind of switching back and forth and that's been working really well. So um, I have a couple questions. One, you are doing hummingbird paintings. How many species of hummingbirds live where you live? I'm just um, curious. Yeah, there's, let me name them off. So there's the Rufus hummingbird, Anna's hummingbird, ruby-throated hummingbird. And then I used to live in the interior of our province, which where another one, the Calliope hummingbird lives. Um, and I kind of befriended a, a bird photographer on Instagram. And so he takes amazing pictures. So he lets me use his photos for reference photos, which is really awesome. And then he actually just went to South America and took a whole bunch of South American hummingbird pictures. So I've been kind of working those ones into the lineup as well. So doing a few exotic ones, and then I'm going to do all the ones here in British Columbia. And then I did a little research to see, you know, what some rare, more occasional visitors are to my area. And so there's, um, I've never seen these ones, but there's an Allen's hummingbird, which is more common in Oregon and California, a black chinned hummingbird, which looks really cool. So that's kind of how I'm picking what species to do. And I'm, the more I look into it, the more I'm amazed of like how many different types of hummingbirds there are around the world. There are. I checked out a book from the library last summer and I mean, it was a thick book, all of different, the different species. And I don't remember how many hundreds there are, but there are a lot. Here yeah. in Wisconsin, we have just one, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So I'm okay. a little bit jealous when I get to hear about oh. other people having multiple species, but all of them are. Yeah. So I haven't seen a calliope in real life, but they're really interesting with these streaks of purple on their throat. I have been lucky enough to see the Rufus and Anna's and Ruby throated Anna's hummingbird is definitely the most common here where, where I live. Wonderful. And then my other question, and you covered it a little bit talking about working from photographs for your bird. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Do you prefer to work from life or from photographs or a combination of both when you're working on your plants and flowers? I'm just curious. I think a combination of both. Like I took a botanical painting diploma course and it was very, you know, classical and must work from life. And um, that's kind of hard these days. Like I also work a day job. So, you know, my plant will wither away before I, I get to where I want to be. So, and with the cameras today, they're, they're so more, much more advanced than even like five years ago. So what I usually do is um, work from a few different photographs. Um, I don't always find like one photo that has the plant in the exact position and composition that I like, or, you know, I might like one element, the color of this photo, but the layout and composition of the other photo so I'll, I'll do a sketch to start my composition and then use the other detail and color elements out of another photo usually. I do also try and find it really helpful to just sight and see the plant in real life before I paint it. Like I know, you know, most people know what a rose looks like, but it's helpful when you're going to start a detailed painting to look and see how the, you know, the thorns are angled and how the stems connect and you can't always see that as well in some pictures. So a combination of both I think is ideal. Yeah. Okay, and same for you. same for the birds. It's a bit harder for the birds um, to well, sight. Especially a, a hummingbird, <laughs> which is moving so fast all the time. Yeah. So again, knowing someone that can take amazing photos or getting permission from someone, you know, I've found a picture online that I've liked before and just asked and contacted them for permission and most people are really happy for you to paint um, their photo as well. So yeah, that's really helpful. So the bird reference photos are, are you have, I have to be more careful about selecting them for that reason, so. Right, well, thank you. 
My next question is uh, about your creative challenges. What would you say, not the, the challenges that you put on yourself to create your 20 paintings, mm -hmm. but what is challenging to you creatively um, and maybe a stumbling block or whatever? And how do you work to overcome that challenge? Yeah, so probably like a lot of people, my biggest challenge is time. I've had um, some periods where I've been lucky enough to have some time off work or been doing a little bit of work from home. So I've had um, more time to focus on it and that energy to keep going. So my biggest challenge now is that I, I work. Um, a day job as an insurance broker. So I'm doing something very different all day and it can um, drain the energy. So when I come home, you know, make dinner, do that whole business, there's not a lot left for creativity and painting. Um, but I've figured out a few little ways to work around that the best I can. I actually just made a blog post about it. It's five ways to make time for painting. And I kind of often with these blog posts that are like, helpful tips they're more for like me <laughs> to remind me and then hopefully someone in uh, on my website or whatever will also find it helpful but what I've noticed is if I spend time on the weekend doing like the layout and the drawing and getting a new painting started I'm far more likely to be able to just pick it up sometime in the evening after work during the week and paint and add to it um, as well as letting everyone in my family know, you know, this is going to be my painting time. I'm going to take half an hour or an hour, even if it's just 30 minutes to just block that off. So people know that I'm going to be in my, my little space with my desk and um, just be committing to doing that. So everyone's on the same page. And I don't have, I used to have a full painting room and studio, but I moved and circumstances changed. So I just have um, a desk sort of like out in the living room now which is fine because um, I still am able to just pull out all my stuff so again I think like being able to have your art supplies not fully tucked away and just have them laying out there so you can just sit down and get down to it again is also really helpful so yeah I just basically been trying to focus on those little steps that I found help me and then actually stick to them that's great. And I'll make sure to link to your blog post. So okay, great. Everybody yeah, we can read those great tips too. And also not putting that expectation in that little bit of time, say you have during the week to be like, I must create a masterpiece, or I must finish this painting and just allowing yourself to be creative ends up being more productive, I think, than when I'd have like a giant list in my day planner of every little, you know, task I have to tick off. I found that the days I just allowed myself to be an explorer, I ended up getting more done anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the pressure that you have to finish this um, can stop us from creating at all because you can cr create a lot working in small blocks. And if you don't give yourself that time to work in small blocks, because you think, oh, I'll never be able to finish a painting in 15 minutes, but you'd be able to get something accomplished and exactly. if you add up the 50 minutes each day it'll really be a lot of time that you could have yeah. wasted if you discounted it as not being enough exactly yeah no that's so true right so my last question and i've been asking everyone what is the best creative advice that you have gotten along your journey or if you haven't gotten any advice that's really resonated with you What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? I think um, the biggest lesson that I've learned lately, um, and I think I've read some of your posts about this too, is the pressure to produce and post and share. Sharing is great and I love it, but the pressure we have with social media and you know online teaching and all of these wonderful outlets to share your work and communicate and meet other artists, it can also become so daunting to be able to keep up with, you know, a schedule that you make. I'm going to post every other day, or I'm going to send out this monthly, I'm going to create these, this many classes. And I used to do that a lot. And I realized it was draining and it's, it's sometimes hard to keep up. Sometimes I, I over 
exceed. I'm like, oh, I got all this done. It's all going to be posted. That's great. Other times I can't really get a lot done. And I started beating myself up about that. And it took all the joy out of creating, um, obviously, like saying that seems obvious to you, but it's, you know, like the mental daily grind that you have to realize happens. So I guess I think a lot of people have said this in the past, but just making sure that you're actually really creating for yourself first and then being happy to share that with other people that are interested in it instead of, you know, looking at it as like, this is a business and this is what I'm producing. Um, and then creating for yourself in the long run, it, it just seems for me that I'm more successful that way anyway, whether I'm looking at it as a business or just a hobby, it didn't really matter which way I approached it. That was the best kind of realization I guess I had for myself and, um, limiting, I guess, the amount of time I spend comparing to other people's work as well. There's so many amazing, talented artists out there. And you have to look at that little boundary line of when you're getting inspired and feeling connected to, oh, I'm now comparing myself and I'm bringing myself down. So that's something that I kind of became really aware of in the last year and limiting and, and focusing differently with social media has been really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And that's honoring your creativity and not putting pr outside pressures on exactly. something that's supposed to be joyful and beautiful and wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I love the message you send with your website about spreading the joy. And most people that follow my work, it's for inspiration and they, they may not even paint or sometimes they just watch my classes and they don't actually even do the exercise, but it just brings them, you know, joy and enjoyment to take it in. So it's not always about everyone wanting to be the best painter or there's a right. lot more to it. Well, and I know that uh, just the whole, the whole fact of paint and color, all of the beauty in that, even if I'm mixing paint and not creating a finished piece, just doing color swatches or something like that. That is such a joyful thing. And if yeah. you put a lot of pressure on yourself to create something finished, you can um, miss out on just the simple joy of the process and the uh, medium and all of that. Yeah, and that's the beauty of watercolor. And that's what first attracted me was the colors and how they spread and mix. And it just captivated me. So going back to that and focusing on those things while I continue on my journey, I think is really important. And that's what I would recommend to anyone else on their watercolor path. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for joining me for Sips of Inspiration. And everyone watching, thank you for watching. I will be back next month with another interview. But before that, I hope you will take some time to visit Laura's website. I will have a link and you can also say hi to her on social media. Until next time, bye. Bye.